Take your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 13. Thank you, ladies, did an excellent, excellent job. Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter number 13. I don't want to rush the preaching of God's Word this morning. Um, I came to the realization several months ago uh, that people come to God's house to hear God's Word. And uh, so I want to be very sensitive to those who have come uh, that for one purpose, and that is to hear God's Word. Acts chapter 13, if you will. Acts chapter 13. And we're going to start in verse number 20. We're going to read verse 21. Then we're going to read verse number 22. However, I want you to keep your Bibles handy because we are literally going to be reading a lot of verses this morning. And tonight, I do want you to be back tonight. I'm going to preach tonight on, on, on this subject, Beware of the Ziphites. Beware of the Ziphites. And uh, please, if, uh, just be back tonight. I think it's something that we all need, and I think it is a truth uh, that will save us uh, from a lot of heartache and a lot of complication. And uh, so Acts chapter 13, look at verse number 20. And I'm going to go ahead and pray right now and just get right into the sermon. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, seated before me are your people. Seated before me are believers for the most part. And Lord, they have come with that deep desire to hear something that would encourage them to be the kind of Christian that they need to be. This is not a wasted time because we're gathered. This is not a wasted time, dear God, because your word, you promised us on two fronts that when we're gathered together, that you'd be there, and that when your word was spoken, that it would not return void. I pray that our hearts would be the right kind of ground that it needs to be right now to receive the truth that you're going to give us this morning. Bless, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acts chapter 13, verse 20. And after that, he gave unto them judges. Now we're talking about the history of Israel here, and so we're kind of jumping in at a time period. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterwards, we're jumping from the judges now, in this time frame. Now we're jumping into the kings. He's giving us a, a, a lesson, a history lesson here. And afterwards, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. Now let's jump to verse 22. And when he had removed him, talking about King Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Keep your eyes focused. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse. And I want you to underline this next phrase, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my, what? Will. Now that's very important. He says here that he found a man that was after his own heart. God said, I've found the second king of Israel. It is a king that emulates. He mirrors my heart. Very interesting here that he did not mirror his power. God did not say he mirrored his glory. God did not say he mirrored his miracles. But he said, here's a man that mirrors my heart. Look at the man David, you'll see my heart. Look at the man David, and you'll see my will. Now, when you think about David, immediately there are several stories that come to mind that we think, okay, does this define God's heart and his will? That first story, because of our depravity, probably is a story of Bathsheba. But we know that's not God's heart and we know that's not God's will. Then the second story probably is the story of Goliath that comes to our mind. But we know that that's not God's heart and that's not God's will. Then we know the story of Saul. How that Saul and David. But we know that's not God's heart and that's not God's will. There is a story though, and I want you to take your Bible and go to 2 Samuel chapter 13. There is a story in David's life that I truly believe once we marry it with the New Testament that we're going to find out, dear fellow believer, that this is God's heart and this is God's will. And I think that this morning and tonight, I think they're tandem sermons that I think will help all of us in this area. Go to 2 Samuel 13 and verse number 19. And I want us to march right through it if you don't mind. We're going to get into the fourth story 
that I believe is a story of God's heart, God's will. And I think it is the reason why God said, now, now that man carries my heart. That man will fulfill my will. And if it's the story of David and Absalom, in chapter 13 and verse number 19, it says this, And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of divers colors that was on her, and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister, he is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. And when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon, because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years. Absalom gave David two years to take care of the matter. David did not take care of the matter. Now go to 2 Samuel 13, verse 34. But Absalom fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind him. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come. And thy servant said, So it is. And it came to pass, as soon as he made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also and his servants wept very sore. But Absalom fled and went to Tal Talmai, the son of Aminahad, Minahad, king of Jeshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. Absalom killed Amnon because of what Amnon had done to his sister Tamar. David heard about it. Absalom feared David. Absalom takes off and leaves. David says, I'm comforted. What he simply is saying is this, I've come to grips with the fact that Amnon has done this awful thing and that Amnon has paid and that Absalom was the hand by which Amnon had paid. Keep in tune with the story and life of Absalom and the relationship with David. Look at 2 Samuel 14, 25. If you'll turn there, 2 Samuel 14, 25. Absalom's gaining steam here behind the scenes. Absalom becomes the avenger of a wrong. David did not. Absalom all of a sudden flees. Absalom in 2 Samuel 14, 25. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. So a Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Time's marching on. David does not see Absalom. Absalom does not see David. Look at verse chapter 15 and verse number 6. Chapter 15 and verse number 6. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it came to pass after 40 years. Now let's get into the story. Amnon does an awful thing to Tamar. Absalom avenges Tamar, kills Amnon. Absalom flees because he's afraid of King David. He's gone, comes back. It's two years since he sees the king's face. Then all of a sudden, Absalom, verse number 6, here we go, sitting at the hearts, he steals the king's, uh, the, the heart of the, the men of Israel. And it came to pass after 40 years, he did this for 40 years, that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. Look at verse 13, if you don't mind. 2 Samuel 15, verse 13, drop down there. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Now all of a sudden, David realized Absalom's gaining steam. And now Absalom says, the servant says, the men of the heart of Israel is like a tsunami. They are behind Absalom. And David says, i got to get out of the kingdom. So he tells his servants, I'm out of here. Let's flee and let's get out. Look at verse 31. In Absalom's revolt, look at verse 31. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators which, with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Absalom's gaining speed now. He not only has the kingdom behind him, but now he has a conspirator counselor behind him. 
Look at verse number 5, 2 Samuel 16, verse number 5. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 5. Look at it. 2 Samuel 16, 5. And when King David came to Bahiram, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerah. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David. And at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei, when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou man of Belial. Look at the steam that's starting to pick up. Not only has Absalom become a man that took care of Amnon's wrong by killing Amnon, now he's kind of left king's presence. Now he spends time away. He comes back 40 years. He gained the trust in the hearts of the men of Israel. 40 years, the tsunami of disloyalty started to rumble behind the scenes. Finally comes to the ear of the king. They're going to overthrow you. David says, let's go. As David's away, then Absalom takes one of the counselor conspirators and says, Ahithophel, I want you to be my counselor. I want you to give me counsel from the Lord. David knew this about Ahithophel, that Ahithophel always got counsel from the Lord. And it was always the right counsel. That's why David said, oh Lord, turn his counsel. Then we find out that Shimei curses David. He's of the house of Saul, of the persuasion of Absalom, so he curses David. David's facing it right now. Look at chapter 16, verse 22. In that final act of Absalom's public disdain for the king, he does something very awful. Look at verse 22. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Absalom does something unthinkable and unimaginable, except in the 21st century on TV. He spreads a tent in front of all Israel. And he does something that should never be done in public. Absalom's a murderer. Absalom's disloyal. Absalom stole the hearts. Absalom forced the king off the throne. Absalom commits public immorality. Now remember what it said in Acts. This king, this man, is a man after my own heart. This man, David, he'll fulfill all my will. So when do we get to see that heart? We see it right now in 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse number 9. Look at it. And please don't get bored with the reading of God's word because we're going to read for a little bit. Look at it. And Absalom met the servants of David and Absalom rode upon a mule. And the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak and his head caught hold of the oak and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him. And why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Look at it. You're getting ready to see glimpses of the king's heart. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Now we're getting down to why God said, David's a man after my own heart. David mirrored the heart of God. How did he mirror the heart of God? Look in verse, 2 Samuel 18, verse number 19. Here it is. And I really want you to let this story sink into your mind and your heart. And look at it. 2 Samuel 18, 19. Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings, the tidings that Absalom was dead. How that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. 
And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day shalt thou bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Jacob and ran. Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, But howsoever let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahimeaz ran by the way of the plain, and over ran Cushai. And David sat before the two gates. And the watchman went up to the roof over against the gate into the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king. And the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. If he come a pace and drew, and he came a pace and drew near, and the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bring the tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He's a good man, and cometh with what kind of tidings, please? Can you say that again? What kind of tidings was the king, expect, king expecting? Good tidings. And Ahimeaz called and said unto the king, All is well! And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hands against my Lord the king. Please listen to me. Whatever is getting ready to come out of David's mouth is the heart of God. Did you hear that? Whatever is getting ready to escape the lips is God's heart. Because God said in Acts, this man David is a man after my own heart. Not my power, not my glory, not my miracles, not my wrath, not anything. But this is a man that has my heart. Look what it said here. And the king said, I want you to look at, look at the question. I hope Absalom's dead. It's not what it says, does it? I hope I can finally go back to the kingdom. Not what it says. I, I, I hope I get my throne back. It's not what it says. What does it say? Is the young man, Absalom, what? Safe. All this drama, all this conflict, all this war, all this cursing, all this whatever... The only thing the king was concerned about, what's this? Tell me, the young man Absalom's okay. Tell me that we're at peace. Tell me amidst this whole entire conflict, tell me he's okay. Go verse 29, and him he has answered when Joab sent the king's servant, and me thy servant, I, I saw a great tumult. But I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came. And Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? I want you to let this sink in. All this conflict. And the only thing that the king was interested in was this. The safety of the man who did horrible things. You know what God is saying to us this morning? That's my heart. My heart is not destruction. My heart is not wrath. My heart is not anything. But I just want to know this. The people involved in the conflict, are they okay? Look at verse number 33. Look at the end of verse 32, I'm sorry. And Cushai answered, the enemies of my lord the king, and all that that rise up against thee, to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. And the king was very much moved. And went up to the chamber over against the gate and wept. And as he wept, he said, and I want you to stick this phrase in the back of your mind, 
O my son Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God... Uh Uh-oh. Look at the phrase, people. Would God... I had, what? Died for thee. When God looks at the conflict of this world, the reason he wanted David is because he knew David carried his heart. And that was this, that David would have willingly, gladly been that sacrifice in that oak tree so that Absalom would not have had to die in that oak tree. Can I tell you something this morning? When God said, that's a man after my own heart, You know what he was literally saying? I'm going to give you an Old Testament of the heart of how I feel in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. And when we sit here this morning, you and I must understand that if we're going to be the Christian after God's own heart, if we are going to be the walking billboard of God to this world, If we are going to be the Christian that we have to be in this world, then we cannot emulate, look right at this way, we cannot emulate the wrath of God, we cannot imitate the power of God, the miracles of God, we must, in the midst of a conflict, always emulate the heart of God. And you know what the heart of God is? It's always safety for those who try to kill us. Always safety for those who are doing us wrong. The ability to look past the conflict and look past the consequence and look past the conditions is that ability and it's the only time that you are going to be put to the test if you've got the heart of God. But if it comes up, I'm glad he's hanging among the oaks. I'm glad Joab put the darts through his heart. I'm glad that this is over. I'm glad that the finalities come. Good rubbish, good riddance. If that is our heart, then we have not yet adopted what the heart of God is. And in your daily travels, you are going to have Absaloms. In your daily travels, you're going to have that person. But you listen to me. Even when it's that person, you cannot, you cannot bring God's emotion into some place he will not go. God's love. God said this. That's a man. That's a man. Look at that man. And you'll see my heart. Look at how he does this. You'll see me. And in seeing me, I want you to act just like that man. Because David knew. And by the way, can I tell you something? Even the servant who saw Absalom hanging in the tree, you know what he said when Joab said, kill him? You know what even he said? Oh, no, 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 no. You don't get it. I know the heart of the king. How did he know the heart of the king? Because he heard the word of the king. And I'm here to tell you, dear Christian, if you didn't make that spiritual connect right then, then you need to wake up spiritually. He knew the heart of the king because he heard the word of the king. And I'm afraid we don't have the heart of the king because we sleep through the word. We don't pick up the word and read it. We don't spend time in the word. That's why we don't have the heart of the king. But boy, that servant knew, I can't do anything to that young man right there because I heard the king tell you, Joab, don't touch him. You listen to me. You have no right to use any attribute of God in a conflict except his heart. I want you, if you will, notice with me four things I think will help us. First of all, before I give you the four things, we're doing good on time. I've only been preaching for 28 minutes. But we've covered a lot of Bible in 28 minutes. And I hope you're still awake. Matthew 23, verse 37. Remember the phrase I asked you to stick into the back of your mind? In verse 33, he said this, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's amazing. Somebody was saying the other day 
that for every Old Testament passage, there's a sister passage in the New Testament. I'm not quite sure I believe that, but I do find it interesting that I do find a lot of similar segments of verses. Look at Matthew 23, verse 37. Look at it. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Kind of a similarity there, isn't it? David's attitude, Jesus' attitude. If we want to be a Christian after God's own heart, look at Luke 23, 34. Luke 23 and verse number 34. Look at it. Then said Jesus. Luke 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus. Luke 23, 34. I keep forgetting I have a head start on you because I already have it written out. So. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's crazy right there. You tell me they don't know. They arrested him. They don't know. They planned it. They plotted it. You mean they didn't know? You know what the Father said? Jesus said, Father, they have no idea what they've just done. And I want you to forgive them on my behalf. If we're going to be a Christian after God's own heart, the hardest thing you'll ever do is not to emulate his power. It's not to emulate his glory. It's not to emulate his attributes, but the hardest thing that you and I will ever do is emulate his love. Because love has built-in components, and it has four that I want to give you this morning. If we're going to be a Christian after God's own heart, you say, Pastor, how do I do this? I, I understand what you're trying to say. Now, how do I put it into practice? Four ways. Number one, refuse to fight. Refuse to fight. David was not a coward when he left the kingdom. He just said, I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. I think the biggest promise you can make to yourself as a Christian is this. I'm not fighting. You want the kingdom? You got the kingdom. You want the throne? You got the throne. But I am not fighting. It takes two to fight. It takes two. Listen to me. Refuse to fight. Absalom, David. David said, I'm not fighting you. He said, let's go. Second of all, refuse to fight those who curse you because of the conflict. Refuse to fight those who curse you because of the conflict. Shimei took advantage to speak what little mind he did not have. With words he should never have used. And do you know what the people around David said? Are you going to take this? You know what David said? Leave him alone. And the Bible says that as they walked, he not only said, leave them alone, but the Bible says as they walked, Shimei was throwing stones and kept the cursing up. Refused to fight. Number two, refuse to fight those who curse you because of the conflict. Number three, desire safety for those who are in conflict with you. Desire safety. The Bible is very clear that if you and I Rejoice when those we are in conflict with have problems. That that probably is the worst thing a Christian can do. Because our Savior, our Savior, our Savior was not willing that any should, what? Perish. But that, how many? All. You mean sodomites? All. You mean murderers? All. You mean uh, thieves? All. You mean embezzlers? All. You mean drunkards? All. You mean cursers? All. Not willing that any should perish, but that what? All should come. Number three, desire safety for those who are in conflict with you. Number four, grieve. Grieve when calamity does happen. Grieve when calamity does happen. 
Now please listen to what I'm about to tell you. David said, I'm going to refuse to fight. David said, I'm not even going to fight those who want to fight me because of the conflict. David said, I'm going to desire safety. I hope he's safe. He's bringing good tidings. There's got to be safety with the young man. And then he said, number four, when I find out that something has happened, then I will grieve. I will weep. And God looked down from heaven and said, Listen to me, world. May I give you your second king. The first king showed you my stature. He was head and shoulders above everybody. The second king will show you my heart. Which one are you? Who are you? At the center? Who are you? Do we have the heart of God? Please know what I'm about to tell you. Conflict is conflict. A battle's a battle. Family's family. Church is church. Issues are issues. But it's never been the conflict that has ever bothered me. It has always been the heart that has bothered me. Because I don't think at the end of the day that God's heart is glad he's hanging among the oaks. Long-haired hippie got everything he deserved among the oaks. Joab, what'd you do? Good job, Joab. Uh Uh-uh. Oh, Absalom, Absalom. My son, my son. Would God I had died for thee. Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because David knew that my purpose on this earth I've come not to destroy. I've come to give life. And that's why God said that man right there. It's a man after my own heart. Take a look at him. Eternity. Take a look at him. Oh, you look at him. But God, you know what, David? Take a look at him. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the story, this man, this man is a man after my heart. Heavenly Father.